Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, to the Prime Minister, in light of the recent increase in COVID-19 cases, the acute shortage of intensive care unit beds, and the emergence on the global market of the potentially life-saving drug, oral antiviral drug, uh, molinupiravir, will the Prime Minister indicate what steps the government is taking to procure this drug to aid in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic? Prime Minister. M Madam Speaker, while we are concerned about the availability of specific high-level health care in response to the spread of the virus in our population, it is not today helpful to refer to an acute shortage of intensive care beds. We do have to keep our eyes on that situation, Madam Speaker, but at this time, the government policy remains the same, that we will only use medication, protocols and procedures approved by the WHO. My colleague from Faisabad is a medical doctor and he would know that none of these drugs he mentioned here is approved for use by the WHO. He would know that. However, Madam Speaker, since it appears that these, these drugs may have some potential, we await the appropriate approvals for their use in the world. And Madam Speaker, in anticipation of that approval forthcoming, the Ministry of Health is in negotiations with the manufacturer suppliers. And in the event that there's approval, we will be under distribution availability. We will be ready to inform the population and to use them as and when they become approved for use by the competent authority, which is the WHO. Member for Pfizer, Thank you, Prime Minister. And I'm heartened to hear that negotiations are taking place. Prime Minister, would you be in a position to indicate perhaps uh, how many doses of this drug uh, being looked at at this time? No, because what we are talking about is using it if it becomes available, and it is premature at this stage to be talking about number of doses. Member for Orpuch East. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Prime Minister, could you give an assurance to the population that the government will take all steps as you did with the Chinese Sinopharm vaccine? by pre-ordering before approval, so that we can ensure that when these drugs are approved, we have already pre-ordered a certain amount, and we will get it in good time to save the lives of citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, we are in competition with no one, and we spoke about the preparation to use in the same way we were in preparation to use Sinopharm when Sinopharm was being evaluated by the WHO. That is why I'm able to, to say today that our authorities in the Ministry of Health, we have ongoing negotiations and contact with the possible suppliers. So I don't know exactly what difference the member for or approach is, is referring to. It's a standard procedure in preparation to use it in the event that it becomes approved. Please. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Prime Minister, are you aware that most of the supply for this current fiscal year by the company Merck has already been pre-ordered by countries around the world? I am not aware of that. Member for Point up here. Thank you, Madam Speaker. To the Honourable Prime Minister, given your statement, that BP and Shell have indicated that they do not have a supply of gas for train one, Atlantic train one, and the definitive decision will be made on the plant at the end of the first quarter in 2022. Will the Prime Minister state the alternative supplies of gas that would be utilized to operate the plant until then? Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, the operations at Atlantic LNG is a matter for the operators and the shareholders. Train one remains a part of the infrastructure for, for LNG in Trinidad and Tobago, and the shareholders are actively engaged 
in how it may be operationalized or not operationalized. And I do not want the member for Orapuch to have a point up here to paraphrase anything I have said. I have chosen my words very carefully and I have expressed them publicly about the future of Atlantic LNG train one. And those words are in the public domain. And in terms of talking about the, the companies saying that they have not, there are discussions. Some of the discussions are in the public domain. Some remain under the cover of confidentiality. There are negotiations going on. We are actively engaged. And as soon as the official position of the government is available for the population, the population will be advised on any completion of such negotiations as we have done before. Point up here. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Prime Minister. Prime Minister, as we speak today, and given that your uh, NGC had invested over 33 US million US dollars. Do you know if L, um, LNG is being produced by train one presently? I'm glad that the member for Point Pierre has now accepted that he should not go around the country telling people that we have spent $400 million on this matter. And he's, he's now prepared to use the accurate figure of $33 million, $33 million US dollars, because all along he has been in the forefront of misrepresenting the city. So I'm very grateful that you are accepting that we spent $33 million. Madam Speaker, $33 million in a multi-billion industry, right, is in fact a manageable sum. And our negotiating position will not be prejudiced by any premature or negativing of our colleagues on the opposition who put misinformation in the public domain. And whether train one, two, three, whether train one, two, three, or four is operational is a matter for all the shareholders, Madam Speaker. And I say no more at this time. Member for Shagonas East. Madam Speaker, no, North is consistently involved with some cross talk here, and I cannot hear the Prime Minister. Not true. Look, you involved. Members, the Prime Minister will be heard in silence. Let's conduct ourselves with the decorum that is required of us. Member for Shagonas, East. Thank you, Madam Speaker. To the Honorable Prime Minister, will the Prime Minister indicate whether the... Uh, well. Member for Port of Spain, North, St. Anne's West, and Member for Oropuch, East. If it is that the conversation that you all require needs to be of substantial length and volume, I'll invite you all to go outside, complete your conversation, and you're welcome to resume your seats. Member for Shagonis East. Thank you, Madam Speaker. To, to the honor, uh, Honorable Prime Minister, will the Prime Minister indicate whether the decision of China Railways Construction Company Limited to construct the terminal building at the ANR Robinson International Airport was done by sole, sole select or competitive bidding? Madam Speaker, as a senior member of this House and an older MP in this House, I am always very happy to assist and educate our young colleagues who seem not to be able to focus on the business of the House. Madam Speaker, on the 11th of June 2019, the National Development Infrastructure Company Limited, NIDCO, as the executing agency Issued, by an issued an invitation to pre-qualify bidders for the project and subsequently on the 9th of July 2019 invited the following pre-qualified respondents to submit proposals utilizing a two-envelope system, technical and financial. A. China Railway Construction Caribbean Company Limited. B. Beijing Construction Engineering Group Company Limited. C. NH International Caribbean Limited, D, Power Construction Corporation of China, and E, China Gezuba Group Company Limited. After evaluation by NIDCO, China Railway Construction Caribbean Company Limited was awarded the contract on the 1st of November 2019. China Railway was the only bidder at the RFP stage and was awarded a contract in the sum of 134 million US dollars for the main works in the construction of a terminal building, 
There's an associated works at the ENR Robinson International Airport and the upgrade works at the existing terminal. The final price was validated by expert consultants procured by the Andean Development Bank. Madam Speaker, all of this information was in the public domain on many occasions from the appropriate authorized sources of the government of Trinidad and Tobago. Member for Orbuch East. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. Prime Minister, I've taken note of your answer. And Prime Minister, are you aware of another piece of information that was in the public domain, namely that China Railway Construction Limited was debarred and banned from bidding for projects in World Bank and other multilateral development banks' construction programs as a result of being found guilty of fraudulent practices at the end of 2019. Are you aware of that in the public domain as well? Madam Speaker, I'm not surprised that my, my colleague from Oropuch East would know that, and I don't know it. We keep different company. So that kind of... That kind, that kind of information wouldn't be available to Madam Speaker. But I, I wouldn't be surprised at all, Madam Speaker, because, I mean, birds of a feather tend to flock together. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. And I was also amused by the response. Prime Minister, on the note of birds of a, of a feather, could you indicate whether Inner's Investment Limited Alan Warner is member, a partner in the terminal construction and whether you have a business interest. Member for Oropuch East. Member for Oropuch East. Madam Speaker, I didn't, I didn't hear the question. If, if the question is um, repeated, uh, I might be able to ask. Well, it's a question that is out of order based on the original question and the response. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member for Oropuch East. Thank you very much. Madam uh, Speaker to the Prime Minister, Prime Minister, are you aware whether or not in the public construction of the terminal building in, in the Piaco at ANR International Airport, Inez investment of your friend Alan Water is involved in the construction with subcontracts? Are you aware of that? Ma Madam Speaker, every citizen of Trinidad and Tobago is my friend, including Alan Warner. But I'm not aware that Alan Warner is involved in this project at Crown Point. Member for Oropuchi. Prime Minister, are you aware, are you aware, are you aware that, Madam Speaker, the dog killer is disturbing me? As, as much as you all are friends, you kill a dog. as much as you all are friends, and I encourage friendship among members. Mali. I think I think there's a certain standard yes. that we all rise to. I, I, and yes, or Pucci, I, I know you know the standard. Please ask Speaker, your question. Madam Speaker, you could depend on me to maintain my decorum here. But, but, yes, finally, um, on this matter, to the Honorable Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister, do you, could you indicate, as of this time, a completion time on construction of the terminal building in Tobago? No, I could not, but an appropriate question filed to the appropriate minister who can bring you a detailed answer. Member for Karen East. Madam Speaker, Prime Minister, will the Prime Minister indicate to the House whether his administration, through the Ministry of Health and or the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, will be intervening to have significant doses of the new COVID-19 antiviral drugs reserved from Merck and Pfizer for Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Speaker, as I tried to explain in question one, the same thing applies to this question four. These, the drugs to which reference is made by Merck and Pfizer, they are not WHO approved at this time. However, the Ministry of Health has already proactively reached out to the Pfizer International and is awaiting a non-disclosure agreement to continue negotiations. As soon as the drug is approved, if it becomes approved and ready for distribution, the population will be informed and the necessary action will be taken to make it available once it is deemed to be useful for our purpose. Member for Prime Minister, the UK has ordered 480,000 courses. The US has ordered 
3.1 million courses of this drug already, and they ordered it pending approval. Member, are you on you? But you, the rule says without preamble, so if you could quickly get to the question. Prime Minister, um, what I'm trying to say is why couldn't we have pre-ordered these drugs pending WHO approval? Madam Speaker, I don't know what the member for Bar from for Karen East understands when it is said that we are in contact, negotiations are taking place. I have not attempted to indicate what the negotiations are, where they're at, or what we're doing there beyond that statement. So I would not be giving the impression that we are sitting on our hands or doing nothing. That statement I just made indicates that we are in preparation to use it in the event that we can have it and that it's approved. And to tell me that the British did it and the German did it, that doesn't change our position because there are things that they're doing that we don't do. And there are things that they're doing that we will do. So, Madam Speaker, we are, in fact, preparing to use them in the event that they become available and become certified. Member Fakarni. Prime Minister, um, would you say that the vast vaccine procurement fiasco of last year will be avoided this year with the procurement of these new drugs? The only vaccine fiasco that we had last year is when you and your friends tried to undermine the vaccination program. Madam Speaker, I didn't hear what he said. Could I you please said repeat? the only fiasco we had in the vaccine program is when you and your friends try to undermine it by telling people to don't use it and that, we, that they are guinea pigs and they shouldn't use it and that you come out publicly and pretend you're being vaccinated but privately you're telling people don't use it and you have been a major underminer of our vaccination program. Madam Speaker, I would like the Prime Minister to withdraw that because um, he, he has to back that up. He has to back that up. Member for Miaro. Much, Madam Speaker. Rising out of the critical deliberations at COP26, will the Prime Minister inform the House what specific policy decisions does the government intend to undertake to prepare this country for a net zero carbon environment? And what precisely will be the societal impact of SIM? Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, the COP26 is just coming to an end this weekend, and we await the decisions or the outcome of those far-reaching uh, negotiations, discussions, entreaties, and so on. With respect to what the government, where the government is at now prior to this weekend's news, a public statement has been made on that as to what we have done, what we are doing, and I want to give the member the assurance that as soon as the incoming outcome of COP26 is available, an appropriate statement, an appropriate detailed statement will be made to colleagues of this House so that the national position can be crystal clear, both on what we are doing now and what we intend to do going forward. Suffice it to say, Madam Speaker, that we know that we have to make certain adjustments and changes, but we will make here slowly so as not to damage our interest in the process. Member Fumiaro. Mr. would you be in a position to um, offer policy or legislative direction in, to ensure that this administration or any administration coming in stick to the 2030-2040 delivery for the net zero um, agreements out of COP26 and so on? Madam Speaker, we are already on track to doing that. We have, we have taken steps towards electrification of motor transport. We have taken steps to improve our, to, to significantly expand our sustainable power production, um, targeting 10% with respect to the power system that we are putting in place now. All the preparatory work is done. We've got the investment lined up, and we are aiming to do 30% um, by 2030. We are talking about um, reforestation programs. We're talking about ensuring that we use the sustainable resources that are available to us. So we are already Beginning those things, Madam Speaker, and we committed at COP and to the national community and to the world that we'll be going down that road. But as a producer of hydrocarbons, largely gas and to a certain extent oil, we will continue in those businesses as long as there's an international market for them. Member for Naparino. 
Will the Prime Minister inform this House why there are only 52 intensive care unit beds for a population of 1.4 million people when some 5 billion has already been spent on the COVID-19 pandemic? Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, the information with respect to the population size and the number of beds is not new. We are one of the few countries in the world, Madam Speaker, that have a parallel healthcare system, meaning that without interfering with the dispensing of healthcare to the population in the normal way that the population would require healthcare delivery, we created in, in the early days of the pandemic this healthcare system. And the ministry's response in March 2020 started with two ICU beds in Cuba specifically for persons who would have been afflicted from COVID-19. ICU bed capacity has since significantly increased from 35 beds to include an additional 31 ICU beds at ward level and an additional 16 beds at the accident and emergency level. This represents a 100% increase over that period of time, Madam Speaker. The Ministry took a further decision to activate 16 more ICU beds in Trinidad and 6 more in Tobago. This will bring our total ICU capacity up to 104 and not 52. 104 ICU beds, Madam Speaker, in the nation. This increase in ICU bed capacity will also be with the procurement of the requisite equipment, that is ventilators, high flow nasal cannula, and 100 ICU trained nurses, 50 of the ministry's COVID response in March 2020 with two ICU beds in Cuba. ICU bed capacity has since significantly increased from 35 to include an additional 31 beds at ward level and 16 beds at access and emergency. Madam Speaker, it is important to note that when you speak about beds in the hospital, it is not just the physical structure upon which a patient will lie, but more importantly, Madam Speaker, is the healthcare givers, the doctors and the nurses. So for each bed you add to the system, you require a significant number of highly trained personnel. And we take that into account, Madam Speaker. Sir, Member for could the Prime Minister give a breakdown of the ICU beds plus nurses, etc., and ciliary staff in the parallel system and those in the system related to COVID? Madam Speaker, I don't know what cough filling is going on here. I just said that in response to COVID, we created a separate and parallel healthcare delivery system. We started with two ICU beds for that. We are now at 104 and we have been dispensing service to the COVID-inflicted persons in a parallel way. So I don't understand the question. The question is meant to confuse the public. Member for Nakarima. Mm -hmm. There was recently, Prime Minister, fire in Point Lisas. Um, in the event of a major fire, state what contingency measures are in place at, at the level of the, ICU what, beds what, what, to deal what, with what, such what, an issue. Member, that supplemental question is out of order based on the original question asked. It, the, how, how, what percentage of the beds in the ICU units in Trinidad and Tobago are occupied at this moment? Member, again, I will guide you to the standing orders with respect to what uh, matters for prime ministerial questions. I rule that this question is out of order. You can pursue it in another way. Member for Cuba South. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Prime Minister, will the Prime Minister provide this House with the names and position of the Trinidad and Tobago delegation to the United Nations Conference on Climate Change, COP 
26, which was recently held in Glasgow, Scotland. Madam Speaker, Trinidad and Tobago had a full delegation to the COP26. We had a significant number of specialists who were involved in preparation for our climate change response. And when the conference was called, we were in a position to participate fully. The delegation came from three ministries and other areas of interest. From the office of the prime minister, the delegation involved the prime minister of Trinidad and Tobago, the minister in the office of the prime minister, Minister Stuart Young, who was also Minister of Energy and Energy Affairs, um, also from the office of the prime minister, we had uh, Ms. Abby, Mrs. Abby Braffitt, Deputy Press Secretary to the prime minister, and two special branch officers as a standard. From the Ministry of Foreign Affairs came Senator the Honorable Amy Brown, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Kirk Francois, Deputy Permanent Secretary, Office of the Prime Minister, and in operating under the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ms. Nikisha Smith, Senior International Relations Officer, Multilateral Relations Division, Ministry of Foreign and Caricom Affairs. From the Ministry of Planning and Development, the Minister of Planning and Development, Mrs. Kami Robinson Regis, Mr. Kishan Kumar Singh, Head of the Multilateral Environmental Agreements Unit, Ministry of Planning and Development, Ms. Cindy Singh, Climate Change Specialist, Multilateral Environment Agreement Unit, Ministry of Planning and Development. Ms. Uh, we had some other people who were part of the delegation, but they were funded by their own agencies. These include uh, Ms. Crystal Lawrence, Environmental Officer 2, Division of Infrastructure, Quarries, and Environment, Tobago House of Assembly. Ms. Rihanna, Ruana Haynes, Director, Climate Analytics Prime Caribbean. Minister, your time is now spent. Member for Opu, for Kuva South. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Based on the information you have just provided to the House, can you inform this House of the full cost of Trinidad and Tobago's delegation in, to the COP26 conference, which has been incurred by the state? I could not at this point in time, but if the appropriate question is, answered with the, is asked with the appropriate notice, the full details can be made available to this House. Member for Kuvasau. Thank you very much. Um, Prime Minister, will the Prime Minister inform this house, if any financial compensation has been paid to two private citizens who were employed by the office of the Prime Minister to conduct an investigation into the granting of firearms users' licenses by the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, it is clear that many of our colleagues pay no attention to the proceedings in this house. And just as I was happy to advise and educate the member for uh, Chagonas East, I will do so and assist my colleague from Cuba South, except that he's not a new member, he's a senior season member. Madam Speaker, on September 15th, Wednesday, the 15th of September 2021, in this house, and I quote with your indulgence, Madam Speaker, from Hansard, and this took place in this house, where this question was asked, and the answer was as follows, Madam Speaker. The, the question was asked by my colleague from Orapuchi East, actually, and it said, is the Prime Minister prepared to say what was the cost of the venture undertaken by a retired Rear Admiral Pritchard and retired police Barrington. Same question as this one. And the answer was, Madam Speaker, coming from me in my capacity as Prime Minister, I said, Madam Speaker, contrary to the misinformation and obsession with this matter, there has been no cost associated with this matter. So I fail to see how my colleague from Cuba South could come back here today and ask the same question on the same issue, and so you have the same answer. There has been no cost associated with it. 